years of 2020 and 2021, now moving into 2022, have all been marked by fear and fear-mongering. And even as nations begin to ease restrictions, others remain adamant in maintaining the powers gained by governments over the lives of people for their own safety. From Biden being unable to even give definitive answers as to what he plans to do going forward. No way. Message for vaccinated Americans who are wondering why they should continue to restrict their activities given your health officials say most Americans will get COVID at some point. Folks, we'll talk about that later. Come on. Let's go. Why should Americans trust your administration to be COVID when the virus is still around? I'm voting right. Do you think the Republicans would go for the white right? The virus is now going to be the president. To the Canadian government stepping in to try and stop peaceful protests by starving out truckers. A lot of people have seemingly had enough, evidenced as more and more news outlets such as The Atlantic call to just open everything. But what about all those people, all of us, who lived through it? How have the last two years of constant news coverage of the COOF influenced the psychology of regular people forced to endure social isolation, removal of individual agency, inability to see loved ones, perpetually evolving changes in regulations, requirements, and mandates, and the constant deluge of media-induced fear. Need the honking continue until morale prevails? And can morale even prevail at all? How has fear of the coof influenced human psychology and human psychopathology? But first, and because a lot of us have been stuck inside, probably at least a little bit depressed, and not exactly eating the most healthily over the course of the coof, let me tell you about this video's sponsor, which can help you start your morning with a fun but low-carb breakfast to improve your diet and your day. And that's Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon offers a line of cereals that bring back the nostalgia of youth into your adult life, all absolutely guilt-free, with each serving containing 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only 4 net grams of carbs, and about 140 calories. If, like me, you follow a low-carb diet but love carbs, oh, the lengths I will go to to make low-carb soft pretzels then Magic Spoon is a great breakfast choice that won't break keto or disturb your diet, but gives you the satisfaction of not just enjoying something that feels carby and satiates the sweet tooth, but also brings back memories of childhood joy all at the same time. I've liked all the ones that I've tried, but the fruity flavor is definitely my favorite, although the peanut butter is a close second. It's also gluten-free, grain-free, and soy-free, so plenty of people can get in on a healthy dose of nostalgic nutrition. If you want to support the channel and support your own health with a nutritious breakfast, then click the link down below and use my code AIDEN, that's A-Y-D-I-N, to try Magic Spoon for yourself and find your own favorite flavor, all for $5 off your order. Let me know which flavor you guys like the best. But now that we've talked about a great way to start your day, let's instead talk about something far less fun. And that's how mental health has been affected by two years of lockdowns. Given the novel nature of the novel virus, psychologists were immediately concerned with a number of variables that may have affected people during the pandemic. And key amongst them was specific stress associated with COVID as being a unique issue outside of pre-existing psychological problems, which Taylor et al. 2020 assessed in their analysis of COVID stress syndrome. What is it with modernity causing weird cultural diseases to occur? <laughs> I do have his book. <laughs> I do own his book and I have read it. Industrial Society and Its Future. I have read it too. <laughs> I love Reddit. American and Canadian subjects were polled between March and April of 2020 regarding their current anxiety and depression. Various trait characteristics associated with psychopathology, experiences with COVID, for example, having been diagnosed with it, or working in a job with increased risk of contact, and COVID-related distress, and a number of coping mechanisms. In addition to these variables, several factors were assessed, including fear of the dangerousness of COVID, fears of coming in contact with contagions, worry about the socioeconomic cost of the pandemic, xenophobic fears that foreigners were spreading the virus, traumatic stress symptoms such as nightmares and intrusive thoughts, and compulsive checking and reassurance seeking regarding information on the COVID. COVID stress was related positively to days spent in isolation, prepping to isolate, finding isolation stressful and boring, increased awareness of one's body, including aches, pains, and other physical symptoms, and anxiety, sadness, and anger associated with isolation. The most commonly used strategies enacted to cope with this stress that also were perceived to have had a positive effect on said stress were keeping busy by tidying things up, spending time talking to friends. Would you guys be there for me if I was going through something? No. Nope. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it sucks whatever wow. you're going through. Reminding oneself that isolation was for the good of the community, cooking, looking up information about the COOF online, sleeping more than normal, shopping online, finding new hobbies, monitoring oneself for symptoms, drinking more or increased use of recreational drugs, keeping busy by interacting with one's children, 
looking for porn on the internet, hopefully unrelated activities, and meeting with a doctor online. The researchers broke down the degrees of COVID stress syndrome into five categories, ranging from low to high, with only 3% of respondents reporting the lowest level of stress and with 16% reporting the highest level of stress. Of those 16% most concerned with the COOF, 59% also reported severe distress symptoms. Perceived danger and fear of contamination was central in the network analysis of these numerous variables, being most strongly connected to socioeconomic concerns and increased xenophobia, as well as to a lesser degree traumatic symptoms, which in turn were related strongly to persistent checking of the news for more information. Despite the fact that COVID is far more of a threat to the elderly, age had little effect on how much COVID-related stress people possessed. Those from lower socioeconomic brackets tended to have less stress, while women tended to have far more, as did the unemployed, a tautology. Of the poultry 2% of this sample who had been diagnosed with COVID, they were slightly higher in stress than those who had not been diagnosed, while healthcare workers were not more stressed by threat of the disease than those not employed in healthcare. That's not necessarily surprising, as these are healthcare workers and anyone who's read the Swamps of Dagobah story knows that they've seen some- In the middle of the room, the bed was an easy seven feet from the nearest wall, but by the time done we were still. Finding bits of rotten flesh pasted against the back wall, I was. The surgeon, continuing to advance his blade, he did. Continued the torrent did. The patient sees against the ventilator she was, and with every muscle contraction, more of this brackish grey-brown fluid out onto the floor she spewed, until, within minutes, into the other nurse's shoes, seeping it was. <laughs> However, those who were high in COVID stress were more likely to be anxious, depressed, believe in conspiracy theories related to the COOF, although the researchers don't specify what those conspiracy theories were. For several years, Professor Filthy Frank has attempted to find the secret to Adam Sandler's success. This project was funded by Elon Musk. Perform more hygiene-related activities, stockpile food and other supplies, avoid public transport or grocery stores, and wear face masks. Given the results of these early data, and the relationship between fear and the virus, and depression and anxiety and compulsive behaviors, scholars were pretty much immediately concerned about the effects of COVID on the psychopathology of the general public. Thus, Mertens et al. 2020 examined the long-term prevalence of fear of COVID in a sample of predominantly Dutch, but an international group of adults between March and August of 2020. And if these are the effects of COVID fear on the spite elementals known as the Dutch, just imagine how much worse the data would have been had they not been the main source of subjects. Participants were surveyed on their fear of COVID, their intolerance for uncertainty, which is discomfort experienced when one feels as though they cannot anticipate the future, anxiety regarding their health, exposure to media coverage, their general health, the perception that they could mitigate risk through actions such as hand washing, and perceived risk to the health of their loved ones. They found that fear of the COOF quickly increased in early 2020, peaking in April of that year and then began to diminish, remaining mostly stable between June and August. The decline was far steeper in Europe compared to North America, in addition to physical location, being female, having worse general health, having chronic illness, and worrying about the risk to loved ones were all significantly associated with fear of the coronavirus across time. Participants with higher intolerance of uncertainty also tended to show more fear of the coronavirus, and as intolerance of uncertainty increased over time, so too did fear of the COOF. The decrease in fear was less pronounced in those who believed that they were more susceptible to the disease. Moreover, decrease in fear of the coronavirus over time was more pronounced in those with higher illness severity scores, meaning the people who were more sick remained less afraid. So again, it seems that the people most afraid were probably amongst those least likely to be seriously affected. Looking up information about the virus was associated with increased fear, but only when the sources used were traditional media, professional media, and social media, but not general internet searches. That is, fear was not exacerbated by just doing a basic Google search on the topic, but it was by watching CNN. Although there is more than one reason to be afraid when watching CNN. The most trusted name in news has been plagued by back-to-back -back scandals. I'm talking about CNN. A few weeks back, CNN had to fire its primetime star, Chris Cuomo, over accusations of sexual misconduct. Also, for helping his brother, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, who happens to be facing the same charges, sexual misconduct. Now this week, a CNN producer has been accused of pedophilia. Considering it seems that Jeffrey Tubin is the only one at the network who can keep his hands to himself. Multiple models of analysis revealed a consistent effect of female gender, poor general health, and having a chronic illness, as well as worrying about the risk to loved ones, all less significant covariants of fear of COVID. Fears tended to influence each other over time, such that general worries about the COOF in April were related to various different concerns to the COOF by May. 
Similarly, individuals who were taking more precautions in May had previously been more worried about the virus, considered it more dangerous than the flu, took more precautions, and were more likely to stock up on supplies back in April. Those who by May were still worried more about the coronavirus had previously believed that the health authorities were not doing enough to deal with it, that it was more dangerous than the seasonal flu, and were more worried about infections amongst their friends and family in the previous month. By June, however, all general fears fell. Worrying was also partly explained by being in poor personal health and taking more precautions than others, while personal health had been less of an important factor in inducing fear in the previous months. So weirdly, actually being concerned with one's health was of lower concern when people were freaking out the most. These data, however, also show a fatigue effect, in that participants who took more precautions in May were worrying about it less and were less actively stocking supplies and appeared to be worrying less about their general health by June. These data seem to be indicative then that for most people, severe fear of the COOF was pretty much over by June of 2020. However, there was a significant portion of the population, namely women and those with personal health concerns or who had close family with health concerns who maintained a level of elevated fear. The American people are tired of women. In addition to fear, as previously mentioned, stress was certainly another factor that may have influenced mental health over the span of the pandemic. And although it may seem obvious, we should still understand pandemic-influenced stress, aka PISS, which we can do by looking to data from Kauai et al. 2020 in an analysis of 26 countries to better understand who was most stressed out in the early months of the pandemic. The countries with the highest levels of reported stress were Turkey, Japan, and Poland, with the US having an above-average level of stress. In turn, the countries with the lowest levels of stress were Switzerland, Finland, and Denmark. Women were more stressed out than men, as are people cohabitating with children. Less educated people and those who did not have dependents living with them were less stressed. Multi-level modeling further revealed that younger people were more prone to stress than older adults, which again is a bit odd considering that they didn't tend to be the most at risk for serious illness, while married and cohabitating romantic partners were less stressed than single people, which makes a bit more sense as at least you have someone to spend time in lockdown with to reduce that stress, provided you actually like that person. Oh, that son of mine. He's not your son, Fred. Stop torturing me, Ethel. It seems then that the people who are the least stressed out as a result of the pandemic, likely in part as a function of fear, are married, less educated men, while single women with children were probably at greatest risk for COVID stress. Mama got you a kitchen and a stroller, so you can be ready when you give up on your dreams. Thus, we need to understand if the persistent levels of fear and stress that were present over 2020 and 2021 may have had a deleterious effect on the mental health of those who remained afraid or stressed out. At Minute All 2020, examined the prevalence of depression in U.S. adults before and then a few months into the COVID pandemic. These scholars compared the data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey collected before the COOF with data from the COVID-19 Life Stressors Impact on Mental Health and Wellbeing Instrument to look for changes in mental health. They found that 8.5% of participants had depression symptoms before COVID and 27.8% of participants had depression symptoms during the pandemic a nearly 330% increase. Married individuals were less likely to report depression symptoms, as were wealthier individuals. In terms of total population, the results are rather shocking, as after COVID, more than half of Americans, 52.5%, reported some symptoms of mild depression or greater, while before, 24.7% of US residents had some symptoms of mild depression or greater, a twofold increase in symptomology. Just to be clear though, that's any symptom of depression, not actual clinical depression. Mild depression symptoms increased in prevalence from 16% to 24.6%. Moderate symptoms increased from 5.7 to 14.8. Moderately severe symptoms increased from 2.1% to 7.9%. And severe symptoms increased from 0.7% to 5.1%. That's more than a 500% increase in severe depression symptoms. Clearly then, depression symptoms massively increased in the wake of fear induced by the pandemic. But so far we've looked at relatively small individual studies, while the pandemic has been massive and global, so we need to look at massive global level data, which we can do by looking to some of the various meta-analyses that have already been conducted on the subject matter. And we can start by looking to Bauer et al. 2022, who examined mental health over the course of the pandemic to give us an idea of how this latent and lasting fear may have influenced psychopathology over time, drawing from 81 studies on the subject. They found two studies which compared the longitudinal pre-pandemic data with previous nationally representative data sets, with one reporting a small increase in anxiety and a moderate increase in depressive symptoms early on in the pandemic, while another identified a significant increase in suicide risk, ideation, and self-injury during the pandemic compared to pre-pandemic data. Despite these increases, 
Thankfully, an analysis of suicide records from 21 countries found no actual increase in suicide deaths, but people were certainly seemingly thinking a little bit more about it. Not today, old friend, but don't worry. Holidays are just around the corner. These increases in mental health concerns were likely influenced by more than just the presence of the COOF in general, as just knowing someone who had been infected with COVID was associated with depression, anxiety, and PTSD in this meta-analysis. Similarly, fear of infection or passing the virus onto others was associated with depression, self-harm, PTSD, and suicidal ideation. Living in an area with a more severe perceived outbreak was associated with psychological distress and uncertainty concerning when, if ever, the pandemic would finally end. And that, in turn, was associated with self-harm. Loneliness, of course, is never a good thing for mental health, so a serious concern throughout the pandemic has also been lockdowns, and a single review found the prevalence of anxiety and depression among quarantined persons to be massive, comprising 57.9% and 38.8% respectively. A number of reviews found that those quarantined had poor mental health outcomes than non-quarantined individuals. However, one review reported no difference in rates of spiritual thoughts or attempts amongst those living under stay-at-home orders. Well, I guess it could have been worse then? Unexpectedly, two reviews reported home confinement was associated with improved mental health amongst adolescents, including reduced anxiety and depression, which may be the result of those individuals being at least somewhat happy to escape from the anxiety they faced outside in the fear-inducing world of COVID. Also, what kid doesn't like having at least a little bit of time off of school? In addition to lockdowns, another serious issue of concern was that of the effective news, fake or real, on the public's perception of the COOF. Bowerdahl's meta-analysis identified two reviews which found participants provided with more government information about the pandemic reported lower anxiety, while several others reported that following COVID news was associated with higher anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Yeah, the news might have been actively contributing to declines in mental well-being. Sounds extremely dangerous to our democracy. More alarming, some media outlets publish these same fake stories without checking facts first. This, this is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. democracy. Women seemed to be uniquely negatively affected by the pandemic, as being female in a post-COVID world was associated with depression, PTSD, anxiety, psychological distress, and worse, general mental health in a number of studies. Finally, gender parity. Further, two studies found that identifying as LGBTQ plus was associated with poor mental health outcomes. No, I did not see that coming! I mean, specifically during COVID. In all seriousness, though, given that there tends to be a high prevalence of mental health issue comorbidity within much of the LGBTQ community, it's perhaps unsurprising then that having a pre-existing mental health issue was associated with anxiety, depression, and PTSD, and experiencing a worsening of existing mental health issues during the pandemic and was also associated with self-harm, meaning those with pre-existing mental health concerns, including issues like gender dysphoria, may have placed a lot of LGBTQ people at increased risk for struggling under COVID lockdowns. Another group of people who may have had a harder time during the two years of COVID restrictions, which often prevented or limited the ability to work, are those of lower socioeconomic status or background. Review found that financial issues and loss... Look, I'm talking about a really serious issue here, and I'm trying to bring a little bit of levity to it, not only because that's the way I deal with tragedy, but also because I just can't help myself, were associated with depressive symptoms, PTSD, and self-harm. Already try and help out with that. I check Facebook every day for people are threatening to kill themselves, and I try and cheer them up with a quick wee Frankie likes this. Two reviews found that financial stressors were associated with anxiety, although another review showed mixed results. Relatedly then, it should come as no surprise that becoming unemployed, furloughed, or losing work during the pandemic had poor mental health outcomes, including anxiety and distress. Similarly, to those unable to work or being restricted in their ability to work, were those also forced out of school or into distance learning, often disrupting their educational attainment, which we'll learn more about later. Hence, perhaps, why some studies found poor pandemic mental health outcomes amongst university students, including depression, anxiety, psychological distress, and self-harm, with one review finding university students to be uniquely affected with more anxiety and distress compared to the employed population. Thus, it seems that not only women and the LGBTQ community are at increased risk of mental health issues, the unemployed were also at heightened risk. Although there's probably some overlap there. I have, I have like a 20, 25 hour work weeks, which I think is fairly good. Um, so I would like less work hours. Um, and what I do you do, Doreen? Feel, uh, I'm a dog walker. A dog walker. Which was particularly harmful given the increase in the population that was unemployed and furloughed during this time period. Although I do hear that dog walking is a good gig. Speaking of sections of society at unique risk, another group that seemed to suffer mental health issues during these years of COVID lockdown 
was pregnant women. Several studies found that psychiatric symptoms rose amongst pregnant women with a pre-existing mental illness, and that rates of prenatal depression and maternal anxiety increased or were higher on average compared to pre-pandemic levels. But perhaps most horrifyingly and worryingly, one review found that being pregnant was associated with self-harm and suicidal ideation. Great job, media fearmongers, on that one. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. Do you guys see why I'm trying to joke about this stuff? Because if you don't laugh, you'll cry. But Aiden, you may have said at some point during that big depressing data dump, what does any of this really mean? How can we know that these findings were uniquely related to COVID and not some other variable? Maybe these mental health issues were not significantly different from how they were before the pandemic, right? Well, we already saw some evidence that that's not true. But to answer the question further, we can look to another meta-analysis of 61 studies predominantly conducted in North America and in Europe from Robinson et al. 2022, who specifically compared mental health data from before the pandemic up until July of 2020 to get an estimate of how things changed early on. They found a significant and persistent increase in symptoms of anxiety and depression, with the increase in depression being larger than that for anxiety. There was no significant change in measures of mental health or well-being during the first few months of the pandemic, however. They found that changes in the increases in mental health concerns became smaller over time, though, with increases in March and April being small but statistically significant, and then remaining mostly normative in rates of diagnosis, similar to pre-pandemic levels, by July. Robinson et al.'s review found no evidence for changes in mental health symptoms differing based on age, gender, or study continent, but did find an increase in mental health symptoms based on existing physical health, but not mental health conditions. As such, Robinson et al.'s analysis does seem to provide some hopeful information, in that while mental health may have worsened at first, it at least didn't continue to decline exponentially as the pandemic progressed, and of the increases seen at the outset, they were not massive in effect size. We've already covered a lot of really concerning data, and Robinson et al.'s analysis is a little bit less bleak, so I thought it was important to include it. Given that anxiety and depression, though, do seem to be the two mental health issues that did increase in symptomology persistently, even if that increase was not exponential, exactly what has been the longitudinal increase in these two issues in the population during COVID? For more precise answers, we can look to another meta-analysis from Schaefer et al. 2022, who specifically compared symptom prevalence of anxiety, depression, and disordered eating across 36 studies. They found that event rates of anxiety symptoms before the pandemic, which were present in an average of 8.9% of the samples assessed, increased by 250% during the pandemic to an average of 22.6% of the populations assessed. Depression similarly increased from an average of 8.7% pre-pandemic by 210% to 18.3% in the sample. Finally, eating pathology symptoms increased to the smallest degree from 15.3% in their data set by just over 150% to 23.3%. Yeah, only 150%. Differences in symptoms did not vary based on race or gender, with the exception of eating pathology, which was more prevalent in women. Healthcare providers were not more susceptible than individuals who worked in other fields. Additionally, region of origin played little to no effect in the differences present in these data, indicating that with the exception of gender on eating pathology, these increases in anxiety and depression were nearly universal. But were these increases in anxiety and depression the result of the fear-mongering media? Or could they be, in part, explained by the COOF itself? Could COVID be the cause of these mental health disturbances? Although it's pretty much unquestionable that the media has been rife with constant coverage of the COOF, it is questionable as to how much that might have led to the increases in anxiety and depression we've seen in the data. Is it possible instead that the COOF itself influences mental well-being? Several studies assessed in Bauer's review reported that confirmed COVID-19 infection was associated with higher levels of depression, anxiety, psychosis, and mood disorders, self-harm, and thoughts. So it seems there's at least a correlation. And let's look at those correlations. A meta-analysis from Wu et al. 2021. Who? Who, you ignorant Who? 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 Of 66 studies assessing the prevalence of mental health disorders in individuals both infected with the COOF and non-infectious diseases during the pandemic can give us a good idea of the effect of the COOF itself outside of or in addition to the increase in mental health concerns that appear within the general population. For COVID-19 patients, the rate of depression in the pooled samples was 41.7%, compared to 38.8% in quarantined persons, and 31.5% in the general population. Similarly, the prevalence of anxiety in COVID patients was 42.3%, compared to 57.9% in quarantined persons, and 31.9% in the general populace. However, there are plenty of reasons for these findings, namely that being sick, let alone being in the hospital or confined to quarantine, isn't exactly a fun experience, which might explain some of these findings. So instead, we need to look beyond correlation into other measures. 
a systematic review of 31 papers from Willie et al. 2021 in adults under the age of 50 found an increase of incidence of newly diagnosed disorders within the last 14 to 90 days following COVID infection, with 2.5 to 3.4% of patients receiving new diagnoses. But why might that be? Well, several viruses are known to infect the central nervous system, and doctors were quickly concerned that COVID might be capable of causing damage that could lead to long-term mental health disturbances. One way to assess if COVID-19 had a unique effect on psychopathology is to compare it to other coronaviruses, such as acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, and comparing effects of those viruses to what we find in response to COVID, which we can do in a review of 65 papers from Rogers et al. 2020. Their studies collected data from China, Hong Kong, South Korea, Canada, Saudi Arabia, France, Japan, Singapore, the UK, and the US, and followed up with patients between 60 days and 12 years after infection. During acute infection with SARS or MERS, 27.9% of patients reported confusion, 32.6% depressed mood, 35.7% anxiety, 34.1% impaired memory, and 41.9% reported instances of insomnia. After recovery, 10.5% reported depressed move, 12.1% insomnia, 12.3% anxiety, 12.8% irritability, 18.9% memory impairment, 19.3% fatigue, and in one study, 30.4% suffered from traumatic memories related to their illness. Thus, when we look at the increased rates of specifically anxiety and depression, well, it could in fact be the COOF itself is playing a role, given that similar coronaviruses have been associated with such disorders. Despite the fact that only about 5% of the world's population has received an official diagnosis of COVID-19, the real percentage is surely higher than that. And as such, we should understand more about this novel virus and how patients who have recovered from it fare psychologically to understand if these general population-level increases in psychopathology may have been influenced by it. Although Rogers also compared these effects to COVID-19, the study was conducted very early on in the pandemic, and as such, they were unable to make any definitive statements based on the low quality of data available at the time. However, other scholars were able to make comparisons after a little bit more time had passed. Specifically, Zhao et al. 2021 compared the prevalence of psychiatric comorbidities associated with the SARS outbreak of 2003 and the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic using analysis of studies concerning both infections. Of the 36 studies included on COVID-19, the pooled rate of depression was 23.9%, anxiety 23.4%, stress 14.2%, distress 16%, insomnia, 26.5%, PTSD, 24.9%, and general poor mental health, 19.9%. Of the 38 studies on SARS, the prevalence of depression was 27.5%, anxiety, 17.7%, PTSD, 16.8%, and general poor mental health, 26.6%. Although clinical features of both diseases are different, their prevalence of psychiatric comorbidities were similar for depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and poor mental health, although there were some minor differences in subgroup populations. But these are just raw numbers comparing two similar coronavirus comorbidities with psychiatric issues. What are the basic differences in the same sample of psychiatric comorbidities and COVID over time? Claser et al. 2021 looked for the presence of anxiety and depression symptoms in UK subjects who had been diagnosed with COVID during different time spans after diagnosis. Of those diagnosed with the COOF less than 30 days before the survey, 16% reported anxiety or depression symptoms. By 30 to 60 days after diagnosis, symptoms of anxiety or depression were confirmed in 26% of participants while 26.8% were confirmed to have no such symptoms. Between 60 and 90 days, reports were mostly stable, with 22.4% confirming symptoms and 24% disconfirming symptoms. Finally, between 90 and 120 days after diagnosis, reports began to decrease, with percentages being 14.14% yes and 14.86% no to symptoms. However, after more than 120 days, reports increased again, being 21.3% yes and 21.1% no. Subjects who reported increased rates of anxiety or depression were younger, had more comorbidities, and were often female compared to unaffected individuals. While infection alone was associated with psychiatric symptoms, these were exacerbated by several other factors, including unhealthy BMI, existing comorbidities, learning disabilities, and existing mental health issues. Were there any differences between the prevalence of these issues before and after COVID, or between the general and infected population though? Well, it doesn't seem so. As for example, while an anxiety rate of 26.4% is slightly increased compared to pre-pandemic levels of mental health issues in the UK in general, being 18.9% in 2018, that level was broadly comparable to the level seen in the general population in April of 2021, which was 27.3%. Again, while anxiety and depression may have been elevated over the last two years, it doesn't seem that the cause can be clearly assigned to the infection and disease itself.
A later meta-analysis from Bormistrova et al. 2022, for example, looked at 33 studies on the neuropsychological implications of COVID infection on patients. Across the entirety of all samples assessed, which included 6,700 participants, 17.5% reported some mild anxiety symptoms. For severe COVID cases, 19% reported mild anxiety symptoms. Severity of the symptoms were mostly mild to negligible and tended to diminish over time. Specifically, sensitivity analysis showed a decrease in prevalence from 20.68% to 11.11% .11 between the three months follow-up and more than three months follow-up. In turn, 18.85% of all participants experienced some mild symptoms of depression after infection. For severe COVID cases, 20.4% of patients reported minor depression symptoms. Patients who were followed up with three months later halved in their prevalence of depression, with those patients reporting a prevalence of 10.36%. PTSD was present in 17.7% of all patients recovering from the COOF, and for those with severe COVID, the prevalence rate was 19%. Unlike anxiety and depression, the incidences of PTSD actually increased over time, being slightly higher at less than three months follow-up than in over three months follow-up at 18.99% and 12.19% respectively. The most commonly reported concern among recovering COVID patients was sleep disturbances, which were present in 36.6% of all patients, with most reporting poor quality sleep or getting no sleep at all at times. Overall, these results were indicative that while there may have been some slightly elevated levels of anxiety and depression shortly after infection, the prevalence of these symptoms tended to return to relatively normative levels after about three months. Specifically, the prevalence for anxiety was lower compared to SARS, MERS, and Ebola epidemics. I can't even imagine what about Ebola would permanently mentally scar some people. Similar to anxiety, depression mean scores for each study indicated levels from none to mild, and also, much as with anxiety reports, incidences of depression were no higher than would be expected in the general public. And toto then, for all elevated psychological issues that occurred during COVID infection, after three months, it seems that most of these issues returned to relatively normal population levels. For those who did suffer long-term psychiatric issues after being diagnosed with a COOF, in addition to similarities with other coronaviruses that may infect the central nervous system, another issue that may make matters worse is oxygen deprivation. So for a little bit more medical information, let's look at a study of psychopathology outcomes in Ghanaian COVID patients recruited three months after their recovery from Danka and Mante 2022. They found a significant portion of subjects reported symptoms that fell within the pathological range for PTSD, 20.4%. 42.93% for depression, and 46% for anxiety, the latter two both representing rates of symptomology near 10 times higher than general rates of prevalence in Ghana, according to Ayamichi data, which I made sure to look up, as I wasn't sure how great things were going in Ghana in general. A majority of patients who had an existing psychiatric issue continued to report having one after diagnosis, and was more common in women. What was not related, however, was oxygen saturation levels, meaning that particular variable could not be attributed to increases in psychological issues in this sample. But that's not the only sample we have to look at, as a sample of Brazilian patients from Damiano et al. 2022 tracked neuropsychiatric impairments between three and six months after infection, and also looked at the possible influence of various medical conditions outside of the disease itself on psychosocial issues such as fear. When looking only to new diagnoses, they found a prevalence of 2.5% of depression, 1.16% severe depression, 2.79% of any specific phobia, 18.14% of generalized anxiety disorder, and 1.4% of obsessive compulsive disorder. Only two variables assessed were predictive of the increases in new diagnoses of psychopathological problems, those being current frailty and general health status. Current oxygen saturation, intubation, duration of hospital stay, stay in the ICU, and length of hemodialysis, all serious concerns that could have possibly contributed to new psychiatric diagnoses, were unrelated to those diagnoses. Again, meaning that something like a lack of oxygen was not a good predictor of the increase in psychopathology, however minor, that we have seen in parts of the population that have recovered from COVID. It seems then that COVID is related to increased diagnoses of mental health conditions to some degree, which would certainly contribute to the overall increase we've seen across the entire population in psychopathological issues. But what else might have influenced the rises in mental health issues between those who have recovered from the virus and those who had not been exposed to it? We can find some answers to those questions from Paralyse et al. 2021, who examined the various factors associated with self-reported symptoms of depression between those diagnosed with COVID and those without any previous diagnosis between May of 2020 and February of 2021. They found that women were less likely to report symptoms of depression after recovering from the COOF. While both urban and suburban residents were more likely to experience depression after having had COVID, urban residents were far more likely to report depressive symptoms. 
Black respondents were more likely to report having depression after COVID, while Asian respondents were less likely to report depression symptoms. Compared to those who had not had COVID, recovered patients also reported less interest in things, more depressed moods, difficulty sleeping, lower levels of energy, difficulty with motor function, and increased suicidality. As such, it does seem that people who have recovered from COVID are a little bit more likely to have some mental health problems than those who had not had the disease. However, some of the findings in this study allude to another side effect of COVID, and that's problems not just with mood and psychiatric health, but other things like motor function. Is it possible, then, that one of the reasons for all of the craziness surrounding the COVID is because the disease itself doesn't just make people a little bit more crazy, it makes them a little bit, well, slower? There seems to be some evidence that being afraid of the COVID has scared people stupid. But before we look at that, does COVID cause cognitive decline? As previously mentioned, coronaviruses can cause damage to the central nervous system. That can lead to psychiatric issues. And by that same nature, it perhaps should not be surprising that exposure to such an infection could also cause harm to cognitive capacity. So has COVID itself actually made people a little, well, slower? Gallagher et al. 2020 examined not just the psychiatric comorbidities of post coof infection in recovered patients, but also the variable of functional impairment. Functional impairment, as measured by the work and social adjustment scale, concerns problems of being able to work, perform basic daily activities such as cooking, cleaning or paying the bills, struggling to engage in leisure activities with friends or family, such as going to parties or dating, as well as solo leisure activities such as reading or playing video games, and difficulty maintaining personal relationships. These scholars found not only that participants who reported having received a diagnosis of COVID-19 confirmed by a public health official had the highest odds of meeting the criteria for probable anxiety or depression diagnoses, but that they also suffered functional impairment issues. Stress related to having COVID predicted at least 30% of the variance in all four outcomes, anxiety, depression, health-related anxiety, and functional impairment, but had the strongest association with anxiety. These outcomes were most pronounced when subjects also had a loved one who had passed away due to the virus. Nearly one-third of the sample met the clinical cutoff for probable anxiety or depressive disorders, and the likelihood of meeting that criteria was significantly greater in those who believed they had contracted the COOF or had a confirmed diagnosis, as well for those who just knew someone who had been diagnosed or had passed away. As such, it's not just mental health that seems to be deleteriously affected, somewhat by the virus, but basic psychosocial functioning, such as being able to read a book. Read! Oh. Read! Ah! Functional impairment, however, is a common issue that accompanies mental health concerns, though, and doesn't necessarily indicate that just because people were less able to complete a daily activity, that this difficulty was the result of cognitive issues rather than just a symptom of depression. So instead, we should look to data that assesses cognitive functioning directly, which we can do by looking to research from Wu et al. 2020. Who? 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 who surveyed German participants who had recovered from COVID on a variety of variables, including the treatments they had received and the neuropsychiatric issues they had experienced, including impaired cognitive status, and compared their reports to a random sample of German subjects who had not been treated for COVID. It's worth noting that the sample size here is very small, including 17 recovered patients and 10 healthy control subjects, and doesn't allow us to make any causal inferences, as some of these conditions could have been present in patients before contracting COVID. However, the results are still rather interesting. 50% of the COVID sample reported issues with attention deficits. 44% reported issues with concentration and short-term memory problems. 27.8% noted difficulty finding words. 16% felt fatigue. 11% reported mood swings and one patient reported either a lack of energy, phonophobia, which is a fear of sounds, I like this. It's very grown up. And incoherent thoughts each. Not a single subject from the control group reported any of these issues. COVID patients also scored higher in fatigue and depression than did non-patients. Finally, recovered patients scored significantly lower on the cognitive assessment than did the control group, utilizing the modified telephone interview for cognitive status instrument. This test is often used to detect Alzheimer's and includes simple questions such as what's 100 minus 7 and who is the President of the United States? These are not complex questions that most of us would easily fail to answer correctly. Well, maybe that last one for some people. Carrying Nazi fa oh. flags, Jews It was at this moment that he knew he was dumb. These cognitive deficits were independent from hospitalization and sickness duration, severity, and viremia, which is the degree of presence in blood. Thus, it seems that a significant portion of people who have recovered from COVID, at least temporarily, have experienced issues with basic cognitive function. 
a study of 153 patients in the UK, 92% of whom had been diagnosed with COVID via PCR tests, and the remainder of whom had been suspected to have been infected from Varanthraj et al. 2020, assessed the comorbidities of the COOF with neurocognitive disorders and found, again, some disconcerting correlations. 39 patients, comprising 31% of the sample, presented with altered mental status, including 9 with an unspecified encephalopathy and 7 with clinical encephalitis, indicating swelling of the brain. The remaining 23 patients with altered mental status fulfilled the clinical case definitions for psychiatric diagnoses. Only two of these 23 patients had exacerbations of existing enduring mental illness, meaning over 90% of the psychiatric issues that presented after recovering from COVID were new diagnoses. Of those 39 patients who reported neuropsychiatric issues, 10 had new onset psychosis, 6 had neurocognitive, dementia-like syndrome, and 7 had another psychiatric disorder, including one case of catatonia and one of mania. It's important to note the advanced age of the participants in this study, though, as the average age of subjects was 71, so it's not exactly shocking or unexpected to see onset of dementia in that age group. However, 49% of those who presented with a new neuropsychological issue were under the age of 60, indicating that this seemed to be present even in the slightly less aged portion of the sample. In turn, 82% of patients who experienced a neurovascular event, such as stroke, were over the age of 60. These data seem to be indicative that COVID is potentially related to neuropsychiatric issues, including neurocognitive syndrome, which presents with symptoms sometimes similar to dementia. A meta-analysis on the topic from Dario Shadal 2021 included 12 articles, some of which we've already looked at, but can give us a more complete idea of the effect of COVID on cognitive capacity and seem to consistently find that people who had been infected with COVID appeared to present with higher degrees of cognitive impairment than those who had not been infected. Across their analysis, the percentage of patients with global cognitive impairment ranged from 15% all the way up to 80%. In the largest study on COVID and cognitive function available at the time of this analysis, 25.4% of patients had cognitive impairment between three and four weeks after discharge from ICU. Of the studies included, seven specifically examined attention span and executive function, and all of those seven studies found some evidence of executive or attentional deficit. Three of those studies tested patients with the frontal assessment battery, which assesses different aspects of executive functions like fluency, inhibition, and conceptualization, and all three of those studies found abnormal executive scores in varying degrees ranging from 11% frequency to 61%. There were less pronounced results for language impairments, which were assessed in four studies, all of which found issues with lexical or phonemic fluency in between 5.7% to 11% of subjects. Four studies included cognitive tests of memory, and three of those identified varying degrees of impairments, with only one patient diagnosed with severe pathological memory problems. Finally, four studies investigated visual-spatial functioning, and while one found that 40% of COVID patients reported some issue in this domain compared to 16% of the general populace, the other studies did not report such abnormalities. Although it will take years to fully understand the effects of what is being termed long COVID, it seems that there's already some good reason to believe that COVID itself may cause cognitive issues. So while the very disease may play a role in the seeming increase in stupidity, by absolutely no fault of the media or politicians or people, what about fear-mongering? Does fear scare people stupid? If COVID in and of itself can cause cognitive impairments that could have made a portion of the populace just a little bit less able to think clearly and cogently, something that's, again, no one's fault, what about other cognitive concerns that certainly could be someone's fault? And by that, I'm referring to the way the media has broadly covered the COVID crisis. Can fear be as deleterious to cognition as the COVID itself? Well, seems like that might be the case when we look to a study from De Silva, Castanheira, Sharp, and Otto, 2021. These scholars surveyed American participants early on in the pandemic between April and June of 2020 regarding their worries and fears associated with the COOF, and then administered several tasks to measure their cognitive capacity. This is a really fascinating study because the researchers also had access to data collected before the outbreak that they could compare to peri-pandemic data. In general, stress levels related to COVID were relatively stable over time, although financial stress and worry about the pandemic did decrease between April and June. Processing speed was measured using the digital symbol coding task, where participants are shown a series of symbols at the top of their screen, and then shown a single symbol, one at a time, visible beneath the legend, and asked to quickly respond using left or right key presses to confirm or deny if the lower symbol was present in the legend. They found higher levels of pandemic-related worry produced lower levels of performance. This effect was present regardless of age, sex, general stress, financial stress, or other demographic variables besides that of pandemic-related worry. Specifically, greater worry was related to slower response time and fewer correct answers on the test. As time went on, scores on the test generally decreased, while the time needed to answer correctly increased, 
indicating that as the pandemic went on, people were less accurate and less expedient in completing this task, and that pandemic worry was associated with this deficit. The decline was particularly pronounced when compared to pre-pandemic levels and illustrates that fear alone influenced basic information processing capacity. The next test was a task switching program, in which participants' ability to quickly switch between various tasks assessing adaptivity was measured. In half of the trials, subjects were asked to quickly identify if a shape was orange or blue using the arrow keys, and were then asked to switch to similarly identify if the shape was solid or patterned, with the task switching back and forth in goals for some. While pandemic worry did not have a significant influence on switch accuracy, or issues in switching from one task to the other, and I'm not talking about Joy-Con drift there, there was a general negative trend, indicating that more pandemic worry was related to decreased competency on the task. Although this effect was minor and non-significant compared to the pre-pandemic sample, accuracy on the task switching paradigm decreased as the pandemic went on, regardless of if the subject was asked to switch between tasks or complete the same task over and over again. In terms of the amount of time needed to come to the correct answer, there was actually an initial decrease in processing time in April, with this return to basal levels by June, indicating that although people may have struggled with information processing, fear may have caused them to respond more quickly and accurately to the task switching as a function of adaptation. This of course makes sense from an evolutionary perspective, because if one thinks their life is in peril, they are temporarily more adaptive. Next, participants completed the DOT Pattern Expectancy task, which is a measure used to determine proactive cognitive control, a measure of being able to maintain goal-relevant information, keep the goal in sight. In this task, participants are shown a series of dots, called the target, asked to remember the target pattern, and then respond quickly to another series of dots as either being identical to the target or different from the target pattern. They found that individuals worried about the pandemic and who had higher levels of stress were less able, albeit slightly less able, to predict if the current pattern matched the target. The ability to determine if the dot pattern was the same as the target continued to diminish over time as the pandemic continued. However, accuracy was mostly unaffected compared to the baseline before the COOF began, although there was a minor decrease in accuracy by June. Once again, these results are illustrative of a difficulty in capacity to memorize simple information when one is afraid of COVID. Finally, subjects played a risk decision-making game used to determine reticence to make financial decisions that may either aid or harm the subject. In this game, participants are given two options to either win or lose some amount of money, either a lot of money or a small amount, and are shown a bar chart illustrating the probability that such a loss or gain would occur. As always in social science, outliers and statistical probability that fall outside of a 95% confidence interval should be ignored, which is why hopefully any gotcha player's data were excluded from this analysis. Do we know what this is? Yes, yes, very good. This is a whale. Generally, participants' choices were risk-averse for gains and risk-seeking for losses. That is, subjects were more likely to choose an option with a 100% chance of winning $25 than a 25% chance of winning $100, while they were more willing to gamble on a 25% chance of losing $100 than a 100% chance of losing $25. However, this changed over time. Before COVID, people were far more willing to take a risky gamble on the loss gambit, preferring to take the 25% chance on losing 100 bucks, for example, over an assured loss of 25 bucks. Individuals with greater degrees of pandemic-related worry appeared more sensitive to this described risk level, particularly for loss frames. And I'm not referring to Street Fighter V's netcode. Overall, there was an observed decrease in willingness of participants to take risks as the pandemic progressed. What we can glean from these results is that people were generally more worried about protecting what they currently have than they might otherwise have been, understandably, during such an uncertain time. But also that this too was influenced by fear of the COOF. The totality of these findings from the study then are indicative that people who are afraid of COVID, along with people just living with the lockdowns, seem to suffer cognitive impairments and be less willing to take risks in their own lives. Although the dot expectancy task does somewhat measure working memory, Another study from Feldman et al. 2020 examined memory and fear of COVID in more detail in a sample of English-speaking subjects from across the Anglosphere between March and May of 2020 using the NBAC test, which functions similarly to a game of concentration. The correlations conducted here illustrated a statistically significant negative relationship between COVID anxiety and working memory, both during the first assessment and about a week later during the second assessment. Motherfuckers uh. acting like they forgot about Dre. By the third week of assessment, however, the relationship between fear and memory mostly fell off. It fell off. It really did fall off. Indicating that COVID-induced anxiety was highest closest to the initial outbreak of the pandemic and then decreased as time went on, and people began to become a little, well, bored and fed up with the fear-mongering. As lockdowns and mandates were seen as less of a necessity and more like a house guest who had overstayed their welcome. It came without warning. 
They were just being polite. They didn't realize that they'd be stuck with... The thing that wouldn't leave! According to their first model, those with higher COVID-related anxiety levels at pre-screening tended to have poor and back performance at baseline after controlling for demographical characteristics, personality, and general anxiety. In both models, state, general anxiety, did not increase model fit for working memory, while specific COVID anxiety did. In a follow-up analysis, the scholars also tested several other working memory paradigms outside of the NBAC paradigm used in the first analysis, including running memory, simple span, and selective updating, and did not find a significant relationship, as was present for the NBAC working memory test. However, for this one measure of working memory, the results were consistent in that COVID anxiety, and specifically COVID anxiety, was related to diminished performance on working memory tasks, and this was the case even when accounting for demographic variables and individual differences, providing some stark evidence that being afraid of COVID impairs memory. Then again, who can blame one for wanting to forget two years of lockdown? Similar results were present in a sample of administrative staff at the University of Western Macedonia, who were surveyed between December of 2020 and January of 2021. In examination of the relationship between COVID anxiety, psychiatric disturbances, and cognitive functioning, in addition to these variables, resilience was also assessed, which in this context included personal competence, trust in one's instincts, acceptance of change, and feeling in control. Fear of COVID was positively related to anxiety, depression, and stress, and trust in television news stations. One of these things is not like the others, one of these things is far more dangerous, while being negatively related to all types of resilience. This specific type of anxiety was also related to higher scores on the Cognitive Functioning Self-Assessment Scale, which includes elements such as difficulty concentrating. Cognitive deficits were positively correlated with depression, anxiety, and stress, while having a negative relationship with aspects of resilience, meaning that more mentally resilient people were less likely to suffer from impairments to cognitive function under the COVE. Despite these significant associations, the vast majority of subjects, 94.3%, had not been diagnosed with COVID. And as such, these issues with cognitive functioning are largely unrelated to having had the virus. Those who had experienced COVID seemingly became more paranoid, being more likely to check themselves for symptoms than those who had not been diagnosed, meaning the COVID has perhaps made people more careful, but also more forgetful. What else can we be forgetting? Although this is just a relatively small and precise sample, as part of a greater body of literature, it's indicative that just being afraid of COVID, outside of actually having had COVID, is related to problems concentrating. When referring to fears associated with the COOF, it's not necessarily clear what exactly typifies that anxiety. Is it fear of the disease itself causing physical harm? Or could it be fear of isolation and lockdown? And does the type of anxiety influence the seeming present effect on cognitive function? To figure that out, we can look to a study in Turkish subjects from Kira et al. 2021. Participants were surveyed on various types of COVID stressors, including fear of being infected or dying, economic problems, and isolation or routine disturbances. In addition to these specific stressors, personal stress and trauma, including childhood abuse, failures such as dropping out of school, being involved in car accidents, fights or natural disasters, attachment issues with parents, and experiencing trauma indirectly through others, were all measured as well as collective stress or trauma, which includes things like discrimination or oppression. Elements of PTSD, anxiety disorders, and depression were also assessed. Further, subjects completed the Adult Executive Functioning Inventory, which measures both working memory deficits, such as having problem remembering lengthy instructions, and inhibition deficits, such as doing things without first considering the possible outcomes of one's actions. You idiot! You nearly drank a beaker full of sulfuric acid! Yes, it is. Gee, that would have been stupid. <laughs> Fear of COVID infection was positively related to moderate degrees to anxiety, depression, and PTSD, as well as to working memory deficits. However, there was no relationship between fear of getting sick and dying with inhibition deficits. That makes a lot of sense, as if one is terrified of catching a deadly virus, they are understandably going to be a bit more cautious. But at the same time, that fear can seemingly be so overwhelming that it is associated with cognitive deficits in working memory. Then again, this could just be a cultural effect, as the Turkish have a long history of being afraid of people going around and sticking long instruments into their skulls. Similarly to fear of the disease, economic fears associated with the COOF were related to anxiety, depression, and PTSD, as well as to working memory issues, but not inhibition deficits. Isolation fears were also related to anxiety, depression, PTSD, and working memory deficits, but was the only associated fear that was related to inhibition deficits as well. This may be because people who are afraid of isolation may be more disinhibited in their behaviors, wanting to restore freedoms when they fear they have lost them. Looking further at these relationships through regression analysis, which allows us to determine how much change in one variable affects change in another, PTSD was predicted by cumulative stressors and traumas, 
However, adding COVID fear into the model added a significant amount of variance, meaning it's more likely that the correlation between PTSD and COVID anxiety is such that people who have PTSD are more likely to also be anxious about COVID rather than COVID causing PTSD. This was also the case for general anxiety in that COVID-19 anxiety only added more variance to the model and reduced fit. Path analysis found that COVID stressors had direct effects on working memory deficits, and both direct and indirect effects on PTSD, depression, and anxiety, and indirect effects on inhibition deficits. The effect of stressors related to COVID-19 on PTSD accounted for 81% of its total effects on PTSD, 40% of effects on depression, and 30% of total effects on generalized anxiety. Working memory deficits, in turn, had direct effects on inhibition deficits and both direct and indirect effects on depression. The direct effects on working memory on depression accounted for 64% of variance. Further, working memory issues had indirect effects on both PTSD and general anxiety. Similarly, reduced inhibition had direct effects on PTSD and had indirect effects on depression and general anxiety. Taken together then, this study of Turkish adults is indicative that COVID-related stress had a significant effect on depression and anxiety, as well as cognitive functioning. And this was the case regardless of the impact of previous stressors, traumas, as well as the potential impact of viral infection. As such, then, looking back at the currently available data on this subject, it does seem that being afraid of COVID has a unique effect on not just mental health, but the basic ability to concentrate, memorize things, or engage in other simple cognitive functions. If it seems to you that people have gotten just a little bit more stupid over the last two years of COVID pandemic panic, particularly as it concerns the virus itself, well, that's probably because fear itself is affecting people's basic ability to think. When we combine fear effects on working memory and cognition with effects of coronaviruses and their ability to cause damage to the central nervous system, we end up with a bit of a perfect storm for stupidity. So if adults are being affected this way, diminishing in their cognitive capacity due to fear, what about developing minds? In the following and final segment of this video then, let's look at perhaps the most harrowing element of the subjects that we've thus far discussed. And that's the effect of fear and the coof on the psychological and cognitive health of children. For as annoying to outright nightmarish as the restrictions on personal freedoms and daily life that most of us have experienced over the two years of lockdowns and mandates have been, with fear causing psychological and cognitive concerns, one issue that has seemingly fallen through the cracks is that of the psychological health and welfare of children growing up under these conditions. For adults being required to wear a mask to buy a gallon of milk or get a vaccine to be able to continue to earn a living wage are certainly struggles of their own to greater or lesser degrees of severity, but how the coup has affected the future generations is something that we can only just begin to speculate about, but something that we need to understand, no matter how unpleasant the subject matter may be, and it certainly is. I know that this segment will not be enjoyable, but if social science has any value as a field, then we need to extract that value to get an idea of what the fear-mongering and mask-wearing madness of 2020 and 2021 has done to children and how those effects might influence the psychology of the next generation, whom will inevitably inherit the world in which they were born and masked up under. Because if you think Zoomers are indignant about the world that Boomers have set up for them, just imagine about how the post-Zoomer COVID kids are going to feel. Do we even have a word yet for the post-Zoomer generation? Zoomer 2? Tumors? Sorry. Anyway, outside of wearing masks and getting jabbed, children have been intentionally or unintentionally exposed to the same daily despair deluge as have been adults, with mentions of the coof and its effects dominating the news cycle. As such, Cantor and Harrison 2022 were concerned with how news reports regarding the coof may have influenced the psychological well-being of children by frightening them more than the news usually does. This moves 20 miles to the west and you and everyone you know are dead. All of you. Because you can't survive it. It's not possible unless you're very, very lucky. And your kids die too. American parents were surveyed in April of 2020, shortly after the beginning of the pandemic, on their perceptions that their children had been frightened by the news, and if so, what coping mechanisms they had used with their kids in response to those fears, and were questioned on behaviors related to childhood stress, their own fears, and the number of hours that news about COVID was broadcast in their homes. Of their sample, 54.5% of parents reported that their children had experienced fear in response to COOF news coverage, and of those who reported this fear, 75% were described as moderate to severe reactions. Parents who reported that their child had been frightened by the news about COVID also reported statistically increased instances of their children being seemingly nervous or jittery, being unusually quiet, crying or weeping, being seemingly sad, 
repeatedly asking worried questions, having nightmares or difficulty sleeping, asking if bad things can happen to them, trying to get specific thoughts out of their heads, avoiding the news but also seeking out more information about specific topics, acting out or misbehaving, and wanting to spend more time with their parent or caregiver. The news elements that parents believed had been the most influential on their children were school closings, quarantining, reports of people getting sick or dying, and the virus itself. Most issues were reported of being of greater influence in children over the age of seven. Parents mostly mentioned that death and sickness were the topics mentioned by their kids the most in reference to news coverage, citing visceral questions such as asking if they or their parents were going to die. Yeah, welcome to this topic, friends, and it's not gonna get better. Anyway, children who had some sort of media device in their bedrooms, be it a television, computer, smartphone, or tablet, were all reported to have been more frightened than children without access to such devices in their rooms. The Industrial Revolution and its consequences. Similarly, children who spent more hours exposed to news via these various devices were also reported as being more frightened by their parents. It's almost like children aren't normally exposed to this kind of mortality salience, and would probably think it's something that dad puts in his car to make it go faster, and might not always react well to constant news coverage telling them that everybody that they love is going to die. She didn't know any of those things. And now she knows all of those things. She's gonna die. Everybody she knows is gonna die. They're gonna be dead for a very long time and then the sun's gonna explode. Of course, exposure to media alone is unlikely to be the sole predictor of observed increases in frightened children, and parents' own fear likely played a large role. Thus, looking at parental reported degrees of fear, these scholars found, yes, parental fear levels influenced the fear experienced by their children. Specifically, parental fear had a greater influence in increasing the fear in older children, as did parental education level, indicating that more highly educated parents were more likely to induce fear in their kids. Additionally, mothers were also more likely to share their fearfulness than were fathers, and were more prone to transfer stress. All of the data that I'm describing are basically just the plot of it, by the way. And now... I'm gonna have to kill this f***ing clown. Having personal relationships with others who had the coof was also related to increased fear and stress. While the mere presence of media devices in the home were negatively related to both childhood fears and stress, presence in children's bedrooms was positively related to both variables. Overall, parental fear of COVID was far more influential variable in predicting both fear and stress in their children, and when asked what strategies they used to help their kids cope with the situation, the most commonly reported strategies were answering any questions they had, telling them how they can keep themselves safe, and telling them how the parent will keep them safe. Understanding that parents' level of fear had more effect on children than did the media, we should look at how those fears manifest and transfer onto kids from their parents by looking to research from a sample of Italian parents of children between the ages of 6 and 13 from Morelli et al. 2020. It's not like Italian mothers have a reputation for being just a little bit high anxiety concerning their children or anything. Savannah, you cannot take that job offer in a California! <laughs> I will be too far away from my future grandchildren! <laughs> COVID risk factors were assessed by asking parents about whether they themselves had tested positive, or had relatives, friends, or acquaintances that had tested positive, or had been hospitalized due to COVID. If they lived in Northern Italy, which was the most at-risk area during the spread of the pandemic, certainly not the first time Northern Italy has had a problem with germs, and if they were a health worker, specifically a health worker in a department that treated COVID patients. In addition to these factors, other elements that might put families at higher risk to struggle under the pandemic, including socioeconomic status, worsening economic conditions, and being a single parent were also taken into consideration. Further, parents were surveyed on their experiences of psychological distress, their regulation of emotional efficacy, which was their feeling of being able to manage their anxiety related to the COOF, their general parental self-efficacy, which is their belief that they were capable of being a good parent, and reported on issues of emotional distress and problems with emotional regulation in their children. Parents whose lives had more risk factors related to COVID were also more likely to have experienced psychological distress. In turn, parental psychological distress was negatively related to feelings of parental self-efficacy in general and emotional regulatory self-efficacy as applied to COVID. Additionally, this distress was related negatively to the ability of their children to engage in emotional regulatory behaviors and was associated with more negativity in said children. In the full model, we can see that family risk factors and COVID risk factors both influenced parental psychological distress which in turn was robustly and negatively related to feelings of emotional regulatory parental efficacy, that is, a parent's belief that they could control their own emotions for the benefit of their children, and similarly negatively related to a somewhat diminished degree to general feelings of parental efficacy, regardless of emotional regulation. 
Of course, emotional regulation is a trait commonly associated with Italians. Get this through your head, you Jew you! You only exist out here because of me! General parental efficacy was positively related to children's emotional regulation and negatively to children's negativity. I know that sounds like a double negative, but it's really the best way to explain the data accurately. The biological sex and age of children assessed were not significant in influencing these effects, nor did living in northern Italy, where again COVID had been more of an issue than in other parts of the country. That is then, parents who felt that they were at unique risk of being exposed to COVID were more worried about their ability to parent, and when they were more worried about that ability, their children tended to experience more negative emotional reactions and be less able to regulate their own emotional responses to the pandemic. As such, when parents were at greater perceived risk of the COOF, they became more psychologically disturbed, and the more disturbed they were, they seemingly were also likely to transfer that fear onto their children, which resulted in problems with emotional regulation and increased negativity in those kids. A meta-analysis from Panda et al., yeah, that's really the name, of 15 studies which assessed over 22,000 participants examined the impact of the pandemic and quarantine on children, adolescents, and their caretakers, which can give us a better overview of some of the potential effects of these actions on the mental well-being of kids growing up under lockdown. For children with existing disorders, the findings were often mixed. For example, in one study of French children with ADHD, a significant portion of kids actually seemed to improve in symptoms of the disorder, which the scholars speculate may have been due to the removal of children from the in-person school environment, which may cause stress and thus, when education was moved online, anxiety in this children decreased while self-esteem increased. Or maybe the kids just don't like going to school, but I digress. In this sample, 34% of children had no significant change in behavior or worsening of behavior, whereas 31% had some improvement in behavior. The remaining third of children, however, suffered from both behavioral and emotional disturbances, with many parents noting that the lockdowns were an emotional roller coaster for their children, resulting in more sleep problems, aggressiveness, and core ADHD symptoms. An assessment of autistic children reported that between 41% and 35% of children had an increase in the frequency and intensity of behavioral problems, and 19% of parents needed to contact their child's neuropsychiatrist to help with this increase. In otherwise healthy children and adolescents, 11 of the studies included in this meta-analysis were used to better understand the overall effects of lockdowns and quarantine. The results are such that 34.5% of children worldwide were suffering from anxiety, 41.7% from depression, 42.3% irritability, and 30.8% inattention issues. Across these studies, 79.4% of children were negatively affected by the pandemic, with 22.5% presenting with serious fear of COVID, 35.2% being bored, and 21.3% having difficulty sleeping. There was no apparent difference between males and females in these effects. For parents, 52.3% reported symptoms of anxiety, and 27.4% symptoms of depression, and only parents of children who were suffering from some other condition, such as autism or ADHD, reported any need for professional psychiatric support. In total, 70 to 90% of children were found to have worsened in at least one aspect of their behavior during the course of just the first year of the pandemic, and again this effect was such regardless of sex, indicating that perhaps for once, misery of the sexes has found parity. In another review of the literature, published a year later from Viola and Nunes 2021, examining the effects of COVID on both parents and children provides more evidence for the existence and prevalence of psychological and emotional issues within this portion of the populace. The assessed studies were indicative that younger children, aged 3 to 6, were more likely to develop symptoms of fear and anxiety regarding fears of family members being infected than were older children. Irritability and inattention was reported in children across age groups, and parents consistently reported that their children were more insecure, fearful, and isolated during the pandemic than they had been beforehand. Most studies included seem to indicate that these effects were far more pronounced in adolescents than in younger children, with one study of 1,300 teens from three countries forwarding a 28% increase in depressive symptoms within the first six months of the pandemic in adolescents. While that's not confirmation of a definitive increase in clinical depression, it's a worrisome statistic regardless. Even more worrisome, another analysis found that the total levels of depressive symptoms in adolescents rose from 5% to 6.2%, being more pronounced in girls than in boys, and most worrisome, that incidences of suicidal risk rose from 6.1% to 7.1%, with a 34% increase in reported subtle ideation in adolescent girls specifically. I know that I usually try to make these videos funny so that the numbers are all the more palatable, but even I'm struggling here. I guess we can look on the positive side in that while those children may have been suffering, they soldiered on and much like Jeffrey Epstein, didn't kill themselves. <laughs> hey, I managed to make a joke about children and Epstein where Epstein is the victim for once, come on. Take those negative feelings you have towards me and my bad jokes and invest your energy into looking up the finders or something else productive.
So there appears to be substantial evidence that children and adolescents have, much like adults, been negatively emotionally influenced by the pandemic. As I mentioned, there's really no way to determine, at least yet, if these increases in depression and anxiety and the worsening in symptoms in children with existing conditions will result in long-term psychopathological issues if children's mental health has been negatively affected similarly to adults, then have their cognitive functions also similarly been influenced by an environment of fear that has engulfed the culture during the pandemic. To answer that, we can look to data using a sample of Spanish children and adolescents aged 6 to 18 from Levine Servan et al. 2021 regarding their state and trait levels of anxiety, sleep patterns, and executive functioning, which includes questions concerning ability to focus or concentrate, difficulty in problem solving, learning new activities, explaining him or herself, being impulsive, impatient, being emotionally volatile, and of course, the great Spanish pastime, losing a bunch of wars to ice skating windmill tilting clog botherers. As the Spanish were trying to make their way up to Amsterdam, the Dutch just flooded everything in the countryside, leaving the Spanish no way to march their army into the city, so they instead decided to go by boat around the harbor. And once winter came around and everything froze, they simply dropped their soldiers off on the ice to march towards the city. But then the Dutch, like magical ice fairies, come streaming out of the city with ice skates strapped to their feet. And armed with muskets, they skate right into range of the enemy soldiers, pop off a shot, and then immediately wheel out of there. And they just keep on repeating this stupid ice guerrilla warfare until the Spanish line is completely broken and retreating back to the ships. They found that among children who were living under lockdown and quarantine compared to those who were not, there was present deterioration resulting in increased anxiety, rest, and effectiveness in executive functions. Of their sample, 67% of children presented with medium to high trait anxiety, and 67.9% presented with medium to high scores in temporary state anxiety. In relationship to sleep, 40% showed moderate disturbances, 36.4% high disturbances, and 23.6% low disturbances. And remember, these are the Spanish, the people who invented the siesta, so they have about twice as much data to pull from. In regards to executive functioning, these scholars found that between 67.1% and 68.3% of children and adolescents presented with medium to high scores for dysfunction. Yet nearly two-thirds of kids had troubles concentrating, problem solving, and learning under lockdown. There was a strong correlation between state anxiety, produced as a function of temporary concerns, and sleep disturbances, as well as executive functioning, and although trait anxiety was also correlated, the relationship was not as robust. As such, these data are indicative that pandemic lockdowns may have increased anxiety in children between 6 and 18 years old, and that anxiety may affect sleep and negatively impact executive functioning. When kids are scared of COVID then, much as with adults, they seem to suffer some cognitive deficits. Although children are far less likely to be hospitalized or suffer serious side effects as a result of contracting the COOF, if children are similarly cognitively influenced by anxieties related to the virus as are adults, then we should look at potential cognitive deficits of the disease itself on cognitive functions in kids. A study of Italian adolescents between 12 and 13 years old from Froli et al. 2021 examined differences in working memory and IQ across four groups. Those who had not been infected, those who had been infected but were asymptomatic, infected but not hospitalized, and infected and hospitalized. There was no significant difference in performance on subjects who had not contracted the virus and those who were asymptomatic. And while there were also no differences in cognitive functioning between the uninfected, they did find that visual, spatial, planning, and memory skills were lower in subjects who contracted the infection symptomatically but whose symptoms did not require hospitalization. Scores of perceptual reasoning, working memory, and processing speed were lower in subjects who had been infected, as well as in those whose illness resulted in hospitalization, but there was no significant difference between general hospitalization and having been placed in ICU for treatment, indicating that hospitalization in an intensive care unit was not required to produce the decreased competency in visual spatial processing and memory. Any symptomatic infection resulted in these issues. As such, although children are far less likely to get seriously ill from the COOF than are adults, it's possible that those who were infected may have suffered some cognitive damage, much as we see in adult populations. The longitudinal impact of these effects are yet to be evident, but if being scared of COVID affected children's cognitive capacity, and the COOF itself did as well, well, then I struggle to see a rosy-tinted outcome. There's another element of the COOF that has uniquely affected children and adolescents, and that's changed to schooling, with many children having spent close to two years doing most of their learning online and if they are in person, wearing a mask, which many parents and teachers have expressed great frustration in getting particularly young kids from not constantly touching, if not just outright removing it, and with some now reporting children having become afraid to remove them after all of this time, let alone the fact that it seems a bit suspect, at least to me, that there's currently a dearth of data on the effects of masks on child psychology. Point is, 
the normal education system has been disrupted in numerous ways, so we need to see then if educational performance has been affected by those disruptions, which we can do by looking to a study of Dutch students aged 8 to 11 from Engsel Frey and Verhagen 2021. Man, there's always so many Dutch studies. One could say they're clogging up academia. Oh, you stink! In the Netherlands, primary school children take national assessments in January and again in June, allowing these scholars to compare assessment scores from the same year before and after lockdowns were enacted and compare them to previous aggregate assessment data from the last three years. Compared to those previous years, students lost an average of 3.16 percentile points in national distribution, equivalent to 0.08 standard deviations. Children from households with parents who had lower levels of education were particularly negatively affected, suffering losses 40% larger than the average student while other demographic variables, including sex, school grade, subject, or prior performance, had little to no influence on this trend. These scholars hypothesized that these decreases in test scores could be a product of the fact that many children had simply not been in school for a while, rather than some other issue that would cause cognitive decline. And to test this, they also examined general learning readiness, which tasks students with simply reading words aloud and does not concern actual content learned in class. They found that the losses in learning seen in the total sample decreased by 60% when only examining learning readiness. As such, more than half of the educational losses could be attributed to lack of specific knowledge rather than general diminished ability. Although that does mean the other 40% of losses were losses to basic skills, such as being able to read words aloud. But what do these data actually mean? Well, typical estimates of yearly progress for primary school in the Netherlands ranges between 0.3 and 0.6 standard deviations thus taking the effect size of 3.16 by an average of 0.4 standard distributions as seen in previous years, the loss seen amounts to 7.9 weeks of learning, almost the exact period of time that the schools remain closed. If we take the lowest possible standard deviation, this loss would equate to 10 and a half weeks, which would mean that children performed worse than they would have if they hadn't done any schooling whatsoever. In contrast, if we take the higher standard deviation in learning, which had been estimated as high as 0.8 in younger children, then the losses would equate to 3.9 weeks, meaning that even if we take the absolutely most charitable interpretation of these data, children suffered a 50% loss in learning during lockdown. However, if we take a more realistic approach, then children learned just as much while supposedly engaging in distance learning as they would have if they had just taken the two months of closures off as a vacation. These are data from just one country which reopened schools fairly quickly, so what about the rest of the world? According to UNICEF, as of September of 2021, more than 77 million schools worldwide had been closed for more than 18 months. A meta-analysis of 10 studies on the subject from Hammerstein et al. 2021, which included data from China, Germany, the Netherlands, Australia, Belgium, Switzerland, and the US, and included over 7 million elementary and secondary school students, found that the losses experienced during the first months of lockdown were equivalent to those seen during summer vacation, and that attempts to utilize distance learning in younger children were almost wholly ineffective, producing results similar to those one would expect if the child was not attending school at all. They found that younger children were more negatively affected in their learning than older children, and that children from families from a lower socioeconomic status background were more affected than children from families with a higher SES. Further, lower performing students were more affected by school closures in mathematics, while high performing students were more affected in reading. As such, despite all attempts to move teaching online, it doesn't seem to work very well, if at all, particularly on younger children or in impoverished children. And thus, millions of kids are going to come out of this pandemic being two years behind in their education. And the long-term implications of that lag can only be speculated on. But I would imagine it will be difficult for those kids to catch up as they grow and need to prepare for standardized tests for college admission. The COVID generation is going to be a serious concern going forward. And speaking of the COVID generation, looking back to data from UNICEF, they report that as of January 2022, more than 616 million children are still being affected by partial or full school closures, and that the results of these closures may likely be responsible for some deeply troubling findings. For example, before the pandemic, 53% of 10-year-olds in low- and middle-income countries were unable to read or understand simple text. But as of 2022, this rose to 70%. In the U.S., learning losses have been observed in many states, including Texas, California, Colorado, Tennessee, North Carolina, Ohio, Virginia, and Maryland. In Texas, for example, two-thirds of children in grade three tested below their grade level in math in 2021, compared to half of children in 2019. In several Brazilian states, around three in four children in grade two are off track in reading, up from one in two children pre-pandemic. Across Brazil, one in 10 students aged 10 to 15 reported they are not planning to return to school once they reopen, and in South Africa, school children are between 75% and a full school year behind where they should be, 
and about 450,000 have just dropped out of school altogether. Further, early research from Dyer 2021, who conducted basic cognitive tests on babies born during the pandemic, found that these children had a 22-point decrease in IQ compared to previous averages, and that this result was the case despite the fact that the researcher excluded mothers or children with a history of testing positive for COVID, meaning these effects could not be attributed to the effects of the COOF itself on the central nervous system. The long-term stability of this finding is up for debate, but as a preliminary finding, it's harrowing to say the least. It seems that completely outside of the effects of fear or the COOF itself on cognition, lockdowns alone have seemingly been more than enough to have a serious effect on the education of children, effects that we likely will not be able to fully understand for years to come. So on that uplifting note, let's come to a few conclusions. Today we looked at the various psychological and cognitive effects of quarantine, fear, and illness that have plagued the public during the last two years of lockdowns. While just the thought of getting sick has been associated with increased prevalence of mental health issues, including symptoms of depression and anxiety in both adults and children, it's difficult to determine if all of these effects will remain stable when lockdowns and mandates finally end, if they ever fully do, and we're not just already living in the new normal. But if this is the new normal, the difficulty in determining the longevity of these effects is equally confounding. Outside of the mental health concerns caused by fear of the COOF, there is some evidence that having been infected with it also has lasting psychological effects, potentially due to damage to the central nervous system. As such, the effects of fear are compounded by the side effects of the virus itself, leading to record numbers of people suffering symptoms of or being diagnosed with depression and anxiety disorders. Much as with the unknowability of the long-lasting effects of fear on mental health, it's also impossible to know if the cognitive deficits created by the fear that we've seen on memory and concentration will persist over time. And it will take years, if not decades, to see how children have been affected by missing up to two years of school, while in the presence of all these other effects that could negatively impact cognition and psychological well-being. We often hear talk about the medical effects of long COVID, but few seem to want to discuss the psychological, educational, and cognitive effects of not just the virus, but the social response to it. And as time marches on, we will be able to see if these events have left scars that will last a generation, let alone the severity of those scars. But hey, what do you guys think? Have you or someone you know experienced any symptoms of depression or anxiety over the coup for quarantines? Have you ever felt so afraid of something that it affected your ability to think straight? What do you think might be the long-term effects of lockdowns on mental health, cognitive capacity, or even education? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below and feed that algorithm. And while you're down there, if you enjoyed this sad video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe if you're not subscribed, and hit that bell button to be notified when I upload like once a month, because it does take a long time to put these kinds of things together. Although if you really do want to hear more from me, I have started a new podcast, Broken Crown, which goes live at 8 p.m. GMT, 3 p.m. EST, every Wednesday, links to which will be down below in the description. As always, I want to give an enormous and eternal thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. You all are absolutely amazing and you allow me to make these long, research-heavy videos. If you want to see your name on the screen here with these fine fellows, links to support are down below along with links to this video's sponsor and to my merch store if you want some social science drip. Thank you all so much for watching this video, and while I'm not sure how to end it on a high note, I do hope you all are having a wonderful day, in spite of the depressing data. Take care, friends, and as always, Altana Volt.